Welcome to another edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the grand opportunity, the privilege and the pleasure of opening the Bible together and discussing together what is God saying, because every word that we're reading came right from the mouth of God in the original language, and most of the time, most of the time, the translators have been very faithful in their translation. Once in a great while, we spot a verse that the translators did not do too well on, and we can make correction, but basically, we find that the translators did a marvelous job in translating. And the Bible is everything. It gives the key. It is the key to knowledge, the key to supreme knowledge. It tell us, tells us where we came from and when we came from there. It tells us what the end will be and how it will be. And it has information that cannot be found anywhere else. And it is accurate information. It is information that is absolutely dependable. And uh, therefore, as we learn from the Bible, it should impact our lives very seriously. If we truly are taking it seriously, that the Bible is the Word of God. And we better take that seriously because it has been given to us by God to uh, for our good and for our information. And we better know these important things that we are able to talk about together. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. And so shall we take our first call tonight, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kempe. Yes. Yes, my call is regarding, um, I don't know where in Revelation that where uh, they talk about the 1,000 years. I would like to know exactly what does that mean. Well, you're referring to Revelation 20, and there are, uh, uh, the, the number 1,000 years is mentioned a couple of times, but we have to look at the context to know what it refers to. It okay. can refer to a literal period of time. It can refer to a uh, just a time of completeness. And, and that time of completeness can be a relatively short period of time, or it can be a very, very long period. It happens to be, in Revelation 20, the term 1,000 years, in one instance is referring to a... 2,000 year period approximately from the time of the cross when Satan was bound until the year 1988 when he was loosed in order to uh, be uh, used of God to rule in the churches throughout the great tribulation period. Now that's a period of almost 2,000 years yet it is spoken of as 1,000 years because it is the completeness of time. On the other hand, it also speaks about here about those who will be reigning with Christ a thousand years. And in that case, the thousand years is referring to the uh, an eternity of time, all the way from the moment of salvation, all the way to throughout eternity future. Uh, because that is how long the true believers will be reigning with Christ. It happens to be in Revelation 20, where that term 1,000 years is found, in neither of these cases is speaking of an actual period of 1,000 years. Okay, just a figure. I'm sorry? It's just a figure? So it just uh, uh, it could be completeness. It could be um, what well, because I know it uh, really is. It's a figure uh, of completeness. Now on the other side of the coin, when we go to Second Peter chapter three, there it talks about a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And there, when we study that out, we find 
that the thousand years is a picture of one day and it's exactly one thousand years that is pictured by one day so it depends on the context altogether now we might read in the old testament someplace or other places in the bible about uh, uh, a thousand of this or a thousand of that and it can be a figure of completeness but on the other hand depending on the context it can also mean an actual period of time. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Hi. My question is about the OA meeting, Overview Anonymous meeting for 12-step program. Is that okay to go to something like that? The, well... It, it depends on why you go. If you're going there hoping to find the ultimate answer, the, I, have, I would have to counsel and say, you will not find it. The 12 steps of a uh, program that Alcoholics Anonymous use are actually principles taken from the Bible. So they're good principles. They are good principles. But the goal, the goal is to, so that you will not drink again. And they can assist in helping you not to drink. But they will not solve the fundamental problem. Because alcohol, those who drink alcohol or have a, have a tendency to want more alcohol, really are using alcohol as a god. That is what they have put their trust in. And so while they can follow those 12 steps and, and uh, most of the time remain sober, it does not change the fact that alcohol is still their god. The only permanent cure is to recognize that alcohol is a god. It, 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 it's, we think it can serve us. It, we can feel better after a drink and so on. But in the end, it is a substitute for going to God of the Bible. And there's only one God that we really want to serve, and that is the God of the Bible. And then, when we serve Him, we can get our help from him and it can be permanent help if we become a child of God we will no longer be an alcoholic and it is far more safe and certain and secure and uh, satisfactory than alcohol as a God thank you thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh, hello, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight, sir? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'm a single Christian, and I've never married in my life, and given most of my life to, <clears throat> excuse me, military and uh, other services. And I was wondering if you could give me any biblical verses or any um, ideas about how to, you know, go through life's challenging moments as far as. Um, not having a mate. Well, biblical advice, how to get through life without without being married? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, it might be easier than if you are married. Just because you have a wife, that doesn't ease your problem. In many instances, it makes the problem worse because you not only have to deal with your own problem, but you have to deal with the problems of your wife. And you have to deal with the problems of, of uh, trying to remain on a loving, uh, fine relationship with your wife. It can actually complicate matters. However, whether we're married or whether we're single, the only and best answer is the Bible. Is the Bible. Now, 
you have a problem. And so you start reading the Bible. It's not going to, you're not going to find an answer hitting you right between the eyes just because you opened the Bible and started reading. But accompanying the reading of the Bible, God gives us that wonderful principle of prayer. And so we can go to God, and I have to do it all the time. Oh, Lord, I don't know anything. Oh, Lord, I don't trust me at all. I don't trust my wisdom at all. Oh, Lord, have mercy and guide me. Oh, Lord, uh, will thou uh, help me to uh, make a wise decision? And uh, repeatedly, I have to go to the Lord that way because, frankly, I don't trust myself. And I know that my wisdom is nothing compared with the wisdom of God. And I know that the wisdom of God is so marvelous. And he is the one who can guide us through uh, by bringing us, as we search, as we read the Bible, to another verse that might speak to our problem or just put an idea in our head. We don't even know that it came from God at all, except that suddenly we had another idea. Uh, oh, hey, why didn't I think of that one before? And uh, and we test that and find that it's better than anything that we had thought of before. So really, the, the answer is the Bible and God through the Bible. We never look at the Bible independent of God because it is the living word of God and it comes to reality, to life as God blesses what we're reading in our li- and, and blesses that in our life. Just go to the Bible then and look for Keep, the Psalms or something. I find them very comforting. Look in the Bible, but look in the Bible with lots of prayer. Prayer. We're not accustomed to this many times. To pray, we uh, uh, and we don't have to pray out loud. We don't have to pray in in uh, beautiful sentences. It can be very, very simple. As simple as, "Oh Lord, I'm in trouble. Help me." Oh Lord, I'm in trouble. Have mercy. Have mercy. And uh, and uh, but we should never hesitate to to beseech the Lord. Beg the Lord, plead with the Lord again and again and again, because he is a God of mercy. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome uh, to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. How you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. Can you i got two questions. Can you look at Deuteronomy chapter 23? Deuteronomy chapter 23. Let's turn to that. Verse 2. There we read. A bastard, and that bastard is an old English word for an illegitimate son, someone who is born out of wedlock. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of Jehovah, Even to this tenth generation shall he not come into the congregation of Jehovah. Now, what is your question? Now, doesn't that actually mean that if a child was born without the mother and father actually being married, that they can never enter heaven? No, that is the way a lot of people would read this. God is simply using an illegitimate child as a picture or a portrait of someone who can never enter into heaven. But that does not mean that every individual child, therefore, cannot enter into heaven. And God disabuses us of that idea when David gave birth to an illegitimate son. Remember that he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and a baby was born to them, and uh, and uh, out of wedlock, and uh, uh, then the baby very quickly became very sick, and David pleaded with God and prayed, "Oh Lord," and he he was really in sorrow 
that that baby was uh, so ill that it was dying. And finally the time came when it died. And then David did something very curious. He he uh, uh, stopped his uh, his stopped his weeping, and he took food and changed his garments, and uh, appeared somewhat happy. And uh, the servants came to him and said, "What's going on? What's going on? I, we would think you would be weeping more than ever now that your baby." Ha- has died and you've been praying that it might not die but David said well uh, I know that I shall go to be with him how did he know that because God must have given him that message otherwise he could not know that he had no idea whether that child was elect or not was one that God had planned to save but God had given him that information uh, so that it could be written in the Bible so that we might know any illegitimate child has just as much possibility of being a lech child as anyone else even though God did use illegitimate children as a figure of those who could not come into the kingdom of God okay my second question is, do you, do you believe it's safe to say that the people that actually crucified and killed Jesus have no chance of uh, salvation at all, or there still is a chance? Well, uh, there are those who killed Jesus who may have been God's elect. Uh, we don't know what God's plan was for each of these. Uh, they are still physically alive after Jesus uh, had been crucified, and uh, uh, and they could become, uh, if God had planned to save them, they could receive a brand new resurrected soul at any time before they died. But we, God does not record anything like that. But nevertheless, that easily could have happened. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take? Our next call, please. Welcome to Open Forum. <laughs> Mr. Camping, over the next two years, as a great multitude are being saved, um, this obviously will have a significant impact on, on the world scene. So what kind of uh, manifestations should we expect to see as this great multitude becomes saved over oh, the next two well. years? Oh, well, now, let's wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, whenever God is talking about the number who become saved in any context, it is always a remnant, just a tiny number. However, in comparison with what has happened throughout the 13,000 previous years, during this final 23 years, there is a great multitude. But that great multitude is still only a tiny part of the whole human race. And will it impact the world in any way? No. There are individuals here and there uh, personally who have come into a saving relationship with Christ. And and in the, the, the little bit of time they have left living for him, there's no way that there will be any impact because of this, any impact on the world scene itself. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. It's all one by one, Christ and that individual, Christ and that individual. So the language of a great multitude actually refers to a small number. It's not a great multitude. It's confusing. Is it a, when you say a great multitude, that's obviously a, a large number. Yes, we have to look at these kind of phrases in the light of the whole Bible. Now, when we look at the number saved, for example, we have a number given in the days of Ahab, 7,000, King Ahab of Israel, 7,000 were saved. That figures out if, if the nation of Israel had a million and a half or two million people at that time, and maybe they did, that's pure, pure, just speculating, but if they did, that would be one-third of one percent very very tiny number when we look at 
Jesus ministering at Caesarea, right on the on the shores of the of the of the Sea of Galilee for over three years, virtually nobody became saved, and so on. And when we look at the character of the churches, as they are recorded, the New Testament churches that came into existence before the Bible was completed. And we see how they began early on to follow other Gospels. Then we know that at any... And then when we look at church history, we find that at any time in in the world, there was always just a tiny, tiny number that we could say were in all likelihood saved. As a matter of fact, when we look at those times when it looked like there were many like through the time of revivals and crusades and so on. And then we examine the kind of salvation that was being taught in that day. We find it was a man-made salvation. And all that hoop de do and all that shouting and praising and, and, and so on that was going on was actually futile. A very, very few were actually becoming saved. But during this final 23 years that we're almost to the end of, we're within three years of the end, there, God, as the world has enlarged itself to be almost 7 billion people, God also is quietly saving a great multitude, which is great in comparison with all the other records that we can find about people becoming saved. It does not mean for a moment that it's a great multitude in comparison with all the people of the world. No, 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 no. It's still a relatively small percentage. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, my first question is I want to know what is a marriage in God's eyes? And my second question I want to know, um, are second marriages adulterous in God's eyes? A marriage is when legally in the eyes of the law of the land, and every land has different laws, what constitutes a legal marriage. In our United States, it requires two things, a marriage license and someone who has been properly qualified, uh, uh, licensed to marry, say, I now pronounce you man and wife. They are legally married. Okay. Um, so are they married in God's eyes as well, even if they're like atheists or something? Well, second marriages are adulterous. Because God says that we're, uh, what God has joined together, and he didn't join together a man with two wives. It is one, within, uh, one wife and another. Or he said, the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so uh, there is... There is uh, uh, and now the other question, are atheists are married in God's eyes? Uh, we could ask, uh, because they don't believe in God. That doesn't make any difference. The marriage is not dependent upon what we believe about God. It is an institution, a divine institution, that God has established uh, in the human race. And, and whatever we believe about God is immaterial. When two people are married in the eyes of the law of the land, they are married. But thank you for calling. Of course, this whole business of same-sex marriage, that is something completely different. That has nothing to do with any marriage in the Bible. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you tonight? How are you? Very well, thank you. Yes, Mr. Kemp, and I had a question about Genesis chapter 3, virtually the whole chapter. And my question is this. Adam was created perfect is what you teach. And if Adam was created perfect and Christ died 
before the foundation of the world. He, he paid for those who he came to save. When Adam sinned, is it possible that his sins was immediately paid for? And also, the, in verse 7, it says, and the eyes of both of them were open." And in verse 8, it says, they heard the voice of God. And I know that this has to deal with, usually when their eyes are open, that's, you know, dealing with spiritual being, being saved. And also in verse 8, they heard the Lord's voice. And I know that the Lord said that my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Could you well, I, I, that for me? well, first of all, their eyes were open and they saw their shame. Remember, they they uh, saw they were naked. They saw that they were under the judgment of God because shame is a very, very great part of God's judgment upon wickedness. And they didn't want to look at God in the eye. They hid themselves. And uh, uh, that there's no evidence in the context there that this means that they already had become or that they that their sins had become covered. Now, it may be that they were. We don't know if they had been. Then at some time in Adam's life and in Eve's life, God would have made to given them a brand new resurrected soul. There certainly is no evidence of that. In the gar while they're still in the Garden of Eden, because they are driven out of the Garden of Eden, and they, in order to get into it, they have to get past the, those cherubim with the flaming swords. The swords. That is, they had to get back through uh, uh, one, or having their sins paid for. And so, there's no evidence in the Book of Genesis that they had become saved. They may have later on. We don't know. Okay, well, my next uh, comment on that subject is this. I know that once Christ pays for the sins of those who he come to save, that there's no possible way for us to lose our salvation. Before Adam sinned, was he saved? And if Christ died before the foundation of the world to pay for those sins, then how is it possible for Adam to lose his salvation? Well, he was, you're saved from sin. Before he sinned, he had not, he did not require salvation. When he was created, he was created in the image of God, and all of us were in him. Hold on for just a moment. When Adam was created, he was created with a physical life, like animals have the breath of life. And he was created with the life of Christ. That is, he had spiritual life. Uh, and all of us were in his loins, and therefore we all have that start in the world. We were created in the image and with the life of Christ within us. The moment that he sinned, he did not immediately lose his physical life, but he did immediately lose his life in Christ. He became spiritually dead, and the whole human race became spiritually dead. That's why we read in 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all die. More than that, physically he was sentenced to die, and in time, and in Adam's case it was 930 years of age, that, that he died physically. But uh, that is also uh, a, a function of the wrath of God coming upon those who are not saved. And so, uh, but in the meanwhile, if he had received a glorified, uh, or that is a new resurrected soul, which he could have, the Bible doesn't tell us, but he could have, just like any of us, if we receive a resurrected soul, then again we have the life of Christ so that even we, even though we die physically, we uh, nevertheless have been pardoned of our sin. That death physically no longer is a part of the, of the penalty for sin. It just becomes the glad moment when we are translated from this world into the a presence of the Lord Jesus. But shall we take our next call, please? 
Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, I guess I had a question I want to make. Go ahead with your question. Uh, my question is, um, what is the difference between a person who has been, what they say, call or chosen to do the work of God? What's the difference? Because, because a lot of people say that they have been called to do God's work. But what about people who have been chosen? What's the difference between that? Well, uh, just because a person says, I have been called to do the work of the Lord, that may be so or may not be so. If they're not a child of God, and there's all kinds of people in the world today who claim that they are children of God, that they are born-again believers, and they're called to do the work of Christ, and yet they're not identified with the kingdom of God at all. Uh, they, these same individuals might even put it stronger and say, we have been chosen to do the work of God. Uh, the fact is that if we are a true believer, we are called to do the work of God. Every true believer is, and, and we were chosen to become saved. And when God chose us to become saved, it means that as a child of God, as a saved individual, we will be very serious, very concerned that we will be doing the work of God. Yeah, I just I asked that because I heard a lot of pastors say many are called, but few are chosen. That's a different matter. The f fact is that that is not talking about to do the work of God in the first instance. When, when uh, people, uh, let's say anyone who's listening to this program tonight, they are being called to the, the fact that we're sinners and they ne desperately need salvation if they're not already saved. And many are called. But that does not mean that they are chosen to become saved. There is a remnant chosen by grace that God chose that will become saved. We don't know who they are. We don't know if we're still an unsaved person, whether we are chosen. But we know that there's still a great multitude coming in. And so we can have a great hope that maybe I, too, am chosen. Yeah, but what if, what if you get a message from God and says, and listen, uh, God wants you to do his work. I mean, what, does that mean that you're chosen? I mean, God personally comes to you in, in a dream and send somebody and say, hey, God wants you to work that, with him. That is an impossibility. If someone comes to you and say, I heard a voice speak to me. I know it was the voice of God. I had a vision. It was so real. I know it was from God. You can rest assured it did not come from God. If it, uh, if it really was a supernatural experience, it had to come from Satan. The reason we know that is that because the Bible says we're not to add to the words of this book. The Bible is the only place we can find a message from God. And if we think we've got a message from God from any other source, a dream, a vision, an experience, or whatever it is, we can rest assured that it did not come from God. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping? Yes. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Camping, I've been listening to you every night, and I thank Jehovah for bringing you back to us. I have a uh, very important question. I have a friend who is a Jehovah Witness, and she was talking to me about uh, the 144,000. Um, I was wondering, what is that? She was saying that they're chosen. Well, that hundred. when we read that passage very carefully, we'll find that, first of all, the number 144,000 is simply a uh, uh, allegorical way of speaking uh, the complete uh, the complete fullness 
of all those who are in view. Notice, 12,000 from each of 12 tribes. Now, uh, and the tribes were representing the uh, kingdom of God, even as the church age, throughout the church age, represents the kingdom of God. And so when we get all finished studying that, we find that the 144,000 are the complete fullness of all those who became saved throughout the 1955 years of the church age. That is what God has in mind there. It's not a, a, an actual number. It is simply a symbolical number. We don't know what the complete fullness it may have been, somewhere around 150,000. We don't know. We, 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 uh, there's no way of even guessing because we uh, don't have good enough records to do that. Oh, okay. Uh, now, she also was talking about Jesus, um, that God was going to give the crown to Jesus Christ. Um, well, well, now, excuse me. Now, you're talking to someone who has an entirely wrong view of the Bible. They call themselves Jehovah Witnesses, and yet they are, uh, yet they are, uh, and they are insisting that Jesus is not Jehovah, that he is not God, but that he is uh, some kind of a son of God that was a super son, but nevertheless he was not God. And they deny flatly what we read in Isaiah 43. I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. God insists that Christ is Jehovah. And so uh, they are they're completely going down a path which is entirely contrary to the Bible. So you don't want to spend your time learning that kind of material. It'll just confuse you. Yes. And shall I we? Actually, I actually, we got into an argument about that, um, so I just stopped talking about it. Yes. But I thank you for, for clarifying that for me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take the next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, welcome. How are you doing today, Brother Kempsey? Yeah, very well, thank you. Well, first I'd like to say that uh, I really appreciate and respect, you know, the, the vigor that you have for, you know, proclaiming God's Word. And I wanted to talk to you about the end of the church age. And I'm having a little confusion where when God had established His, his covenant with Israel, he did so with the Old Testament, and that was signified by, you know, his covenant with Abraham and further on through Moses through the law and everything. And when he was finished with them for that time, he established a new covenant with the church, and that was signified by the crucifixion of Jesus, his death. So what covenant has been brought to light for the end of the church age and this new era that you're Well, for example, I, the, the word the covenant is the word law, and the very fact that for 1,480 years, the nation of Israel were the special people through whom God was working. And then in the time of Christ, God gave us more uh, of the law of God and also shifted from the nation of Israel to the local congregations and spoke of them as the covenant people. And, and we know that their duration continued uh, for 1955 years. And we're not surprised that that shift did occur. But God also anticipated another shift. We read, for example, I think I can find this, maybe I can, in, uh, in, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 or chapter 8, let me see where that might be, uh, where he says, 
in Hebrews chapter 9. Um, hmm. Oh, I don't have that really handy right in front of me. But there he speaks about uh, that, uh, that of a, uh, a covenant whereby he no longer, where he would be, or speak directly with the individual, directly with the individual, and not be uh, speaking uh, through an organization of some kind. Uh, he, uh, uh, this is because, this is because uh, uh, God had a third plan. The first plan was uh, through the nation of Israel. The second plan was through the uh, the uh, church ages, the church age, and the third plan, not giving us more written material, but opening up the scriptures. Remember, the Bible was sealed and and could only come open uh, when God uh, wanted it to come open, and that's in our day. And then he uh, he. Uh, 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 then he uh, would come directly into the hearts of people and they did not eat anyone to teach them at all. And that's what is happening in our day. But that, that's where my uh, confusion is coming in because the first two were announced with such formality, but this third one seems to be under the radar. But the third seemed under the radar. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? You see, the I fact mean, is, the, uh, the, fa the, the fact is, we have to go back to Daniel, where God told him to seal up these things that deal with the time of the end until the time of the end. And we're living in the time of the end. And now we're finding all kinds of information that we, the Bible hasn't changed. We're reading the same Bible, but we're learning uh, what God means by phrases that heretofore we did not know at all. And we're finding that uh, that uh, the Bible is almost like a new book many, in many places. It's still exactly the same uh, same words. But now we understand these words, and the, the this this is the time in which we are living, and uh, therefore I encourage everyone who calls themselves a believer read the Bible more carefully than ever. Read it more carefully than ever, because this is the day when God is revealing additional truth to us through His Word, and as you listen to family radio and see some of the things that we have uh, books we have written they all come from the bible and and how come they're coming out well simply because god is opening our spiritual eyes to these things oh, i agree with you and that leads me to a second question if i may and that is with the teaching on the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And that if Christ was slain before the foundations of the world, before man even existed, before man sinned, who slayed him? And if it was God, isn't that kind of a divine suicide? That, well, that's exactly what happened. In other words... Before God ever created anything at all, God worked out his salvation plan in meticulous detail. Uh, he named everybody that would ever come into existence, put them in the book of life. Uh, and he named another, in another book, he named everyone who he planned to save. He called that the Lamb's book of life. Then he named a Christ, who is a God himself, to be the Savior. And so he put all the sins, which God knows the end from the beginning, all the sins, every dirty, rotten one of them, that these people named in the Lamb's Book of Life would sin, 
when they finally came into existence uh, much later in time and they were laid upon Christ and then God poured out his wrath on him and all of this is happening before he ever created anything and Christ was killed and then he rose again from the dead and uh, because that was like a new beginning he now could be called my only begotten son he could be called the son of God and now and now also as the son of God he is given the task of being the creator by the son God created this world and so uh, all has been worked out so that the moment that anyone sinned uh, or that the moment it was time to save someone that all uh, the all the work had already been done then in order to demonstrate to the principalities and powers in the heavens as well as to us uh, to demonstrate this Christ came not again to pay for our sins but to actually uh, endure all of that suffering out in the public uh, where the public eye could see him as he was as he was crucified as a as a vicious criminal as a uh, shameful cursed individual and at the same time he demonstrated how he could save in the last moment because right there before our eyes we see this individual uh, become a child of God and all of this is just a demonstration the payment was made before the foundation of the world but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum mr happy what says revelation 21 says about speaking in tongues speaking in tongues well revelation 21 doesn't talk about speaking let me which verse are you thinking about 21 with the when the addition to the bible addition to the bible yeah yeah i'm not aware that revelation 21 is speaking about in tongues at all but it would be the, the chapters that have to do with tongue speaking uh, uh, or in Revelation 20 uh, or 22 rather in Revelation 22 verse 14 and 15 or 18 and 19 it says if anyone adds to the words of this book I will add to him the plays written herein and anybody who claims that they heard a message from God as they were praying and that they began to utter that message in some unknown language they are in violation of Revelation 22 verse 18 and they're therefore subject to the wrath of God for, uh, for doing that but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Hello? Open Forum. Yes. yes. Uh, one question. Uh, if you say that Jesus is not the Son of God, so Jesus is God himself, so who is the Son of God? If Jesus is God, then who is the Son of God? Well, they're one and the same. You see, there's mystery in the Godhead. How can there be the God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit? And the Bible says of the Lord Jesus Christ, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We don't understand that at all. We just, we just say, yes, yeah, that's what the Bible says. We believe it with all our heart. But we do not try to understand it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, I have a question about um, uh, trying to understand Matthew um, chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. 
verses 42 through 45. Matthew 12. Verse 42. There we read Matthew 12, verse 42. Um, the Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment. Now, the Queen of the South, we must understand, is the Queen of Sheba who came to visit Solomon. And because of this kind of language, we know that she became saved. And she will rise up in the judgment. Now, she will, that is, her body will be resurrected. Her body will be resurrected as a glorified spiritual body uh, because she is a true believer and, uh, and she'll condemn it. Now, you see the fact that in the rapture, all kinds of people are being uh, caught, uh, raptured, they come to life in their bodies and caught up to be with Christ. That's an enormous testimony, an enormous declaration to those who claim to be believers and were really not that, that uh, the ones that were raptured were truly the true believers. And so it becomes a condemnation on those who claim to be true believers and actually were not true believers. And that's what it's been saying here. They, uh, they shall condemn it for, the, 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 for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Then, uh, now in verse 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when it is, when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now, you see, the fact is that that uh, salvation is not just casting the evil spirits out of a person. We can be, the evil spirits can't be everywhere at once. There are, there are a lot of them, but there are not enough for all the people in the world. But just because someone is free of evil spirits does not mean for one moment that he is saved. He not only has to be free of evil spirits, but he has to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and he has to have been given a brand new resurrected soul. And that's a whole different picture altogether. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Mr. Campion? I would like to know, who created God? Uh, God is from everlasting. He has no one created him. We don't understand how God uh, uh, comes on the scene, but he is forever God. And we just, that's the way we leave it. He has, he has always been. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take the next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camping? Yes. Good evening. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great. Okay, um, I, have to, I think I have a correction for you. And then I have another question after that. Um, could you read uh, Jeremiah chapter 28, verse 16? Jeremiah 28, 
there we read, Therefore, thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou, thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against Jehovah. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Okay, what is your question? Yeah, now we know that when the, in the King James Version, when um, the Lord, <coughs> all four letters are capital, that's uh, Jehovah in the original, right? Correct? Yes. Now, <clears throat> but now, that, that's fine. Now we could say Jehovah, but the word before that is not, is, is the word the. And so when you, when, you, when you just read it, you just said, therefore, thus says Jehovah. Like, you didn't, you didn't say the word the. And also, the second... Well, excuse me, we have to pause for this message. Hold on. We have a caller on the line who's asking an interesting question. We see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitalized, and, and, and most of the time we find the word, the article, the, T-H-E, in front of that, the Lord, the Lord. And yet we know that in the original, the word Lord, Lord, was spelled in such a way that we could logically pronounce it the Jehovah, the Jehovah. And we wonder, does that make sense? Well, we're not accustomed to say it that way, but I'll tell you, I think of this another way. Jehovah means Savior. I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. I am the Savior. I am the Jehovah. And so uh, the word the simply uh, underscores the fact there is only one Savior, namely uh, Jehovah. And the word Jehovah, incidentally, is found more than 7,000 times in the Old Testament. So it is a word that God wants us to understand uh, uh, because Savior identifies with Christ. It indicates that Christ doesn't come on the scene, seen just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Christ comes on the scene since the very beginning of time. But shall we take our... Or do we have another question? Brother Kevin? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, um, isn't, is the word the... I mean, isn't that in the original uh, Hebrew, the original language, because it's not italicized? So shouldn't you say the Jehovah instead of just saying Jehovah? No, the word the, if it, unless it's italicized in our King James Bible, it is, a, it is an article that is in the original Hebrew. I said that you should actually right. say the Jehovah. Is that correct? Well, we could, yes, that would be, that would be, uh, we could say it that way. Because yeah, it feels like you're Jehovah, taking away from not saying like the, saying you're saying it, Jehovah. It's like you're taking away from the Word of God. Savior. I am the Savior. I am the Jehovah. And beside me there is no God, for example. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping, how are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Brother Camping, uh, I have a question for you on uh, the living stones, uh, on uh, First Peter Chapter 2, it talks ye also as living stones, and I've heard you talk about that that's a picture of the New Jerusalem of uh, Revelation 21. And it goes on to name the stones, and I'm seeing a connection with the Aaron and the Ephod, where the stones were on the Ephod of the, um, of the high priest, which in case in the Exodus yeah, it was could. Aaron. You see, there is some mystery about this, but you're on the right track. That uh, it probably does relate to the stones that were in the ephod. Now, those stones, probably there was a black stone and a white stone, and depending on how they, uh, the, what what they did when they were addressed, uh, a message did come forth from them. We don't know. It's all mysterious. God does not detail it. But they seem to be tied in to the Word of God. And, and we have the Bible, of course, which is far more articulate than uh, trying to get our answers from the movement 
of a two or two or more stones, uh, we 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 have actually words and sentences and and that are very carefully uh, carefully uh, written. But uh, uh, when we get into heaven, when we get our salvation complete, then we will be able to speak well. I, I got to be careful here. Already, we can speak to God at any time, and He can speak to us any time we read the Bible. But it'll even be better in some many ways once we are with Him in heaven. Yes, Brother Camping. No, I'm, I'm looking at those stones again in Ezekiel 28, verse 13. In Ezekiel. 28, 28, verse 13, there we read, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the Sardis. Now, this is not talking about the stones in the ephod. This is talking about stones that God used to indicate the glory of Israel. Uh, the as he talks here about the topaz and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the uh, jasper, and the, uh, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold, and so on. This is using stones from a different vantage point. We find this kind of language when it talks about the foundation of Jerusalem. We find it when it talks about the crown. Uh, of glory and so on, but uh, uh, that's different than the stones of the ephod. But so thank no you, connection. thank okay. you. No, no connection between the stones of the. Ephod. I don't see any connection between them. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing, Brother Campy? Very well, thank you. A caller called about five or six callers back, and he was kind of confused about the uh, third covenant. Uh, can you read that in Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 12? Yeah, that's, I guess, what I was looking for. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, verse 7 through 12. There we read, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should not no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, now you notice it's plural now, both the first and the second. The first covenant is the Old Testament, second covenant the New Testament, for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, when, or saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And right away we stop and say, Oh, God's going to write some more. No, no, no. When we search this out in the Bible, there's nothing more going to be written. But he goes on. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the uh, out of the land of Egypt because they they uh, continue not in my covenant and I regarded them not saith the Lord for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and here it is after those days. And that is after the church age, when which I dealt with, the, the, with uh, which had its strength in the New Testament. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sin and their iniquities 
will I remember no more. And in, in, in that he said, a new covenant, he hath made the best, the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. In other words, the focus today is on all the information that we're learning from the Bible that has never been known before. But it is all coming out of the Bible, and God is saying that it's like an, another covenant. It's like the first, uh, the, what we understood it from the Bible before this time, is not sufficient by any means at all. And this is the reason that during these last months and years we have been learning so many things that have never been taught before. Correct. Right. Okay, that, Brother Campbell, I just have a, one verse for you to look at for me here. Uh, it's in Hebrews 9, 16, and 17. Well, there we can close that up by reading there. And uh, for where a testament and a testament and a covenant are the same, for where a covenant or a testament is a force after men are, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you, and so on. And, uh, and what he's really uh, saying, of course, that the law of God is also like a will, and others, other language that develops this, that uh, because Christ has died, now all the terms of the will are available. And since he died from before the foundation of the world, those terms actually, uh, those promises have been available to the human race from the very beginning. Okay, that was that was my that was my uh, question there because uh, the testator uh, had to die in order for uh, salvation to go into effect, correct? And that happened before the foundation of the world, right? Yes. It, okay. It, uh, and that made that brought all the promises to the fore that they could be accomplished. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother. Yes. Brother Camping? Yes. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the Bibles, like the, um, the uh, New Testament, or uh, actually the King James. Why is the King James Version, uh, why do you recommend that one? Well, it just happens to be uh, uh, that... When we compare all of the Bibles that are available today, uh, the King James is the most accurate translation, particularly of the original Greek in the New Testament. It has been around, incidentally, for 400 years. It has stood the test of time, and uh, there just is no Bible that's more accurate in its translation than the King James. The, the Latin Vulgate uh, Bible that the Catholics use, was that, um, was that written earlier? No, the Latin Vulgate is a translation from the Greek into the Latin language. And already many, many errors were made in translation. Then later on, many of the modern translations were translated from the, from the Vulgate, from the Latin Bible, and those same errors continue. And so we would never look at the Vulgate as being as... You see, when the translators, uh, the King James translators, did their translation, they went back to the very earliest manuscripts that were... that had never been touched by the Roman language at all, by the by, the uh, uh, Latin translators, it was uh, uh, they went back to uh, the period between 100 and 200 B.C. Uh, for most of the translation of the New Testament, whereas the 
the Vulgate comes from uh, manuscripts that were written uh, more like 400 B uh, A.D. or 500 A.D., and there already had been errors that came into them. Oh, okay. And like the New American Standard and all those other Bibles, are, and I, I understand they were translated from the King James and therefore subject to error. Is that correct? I don't know how it was, but it certainly does not have the authority of the King James. I would never want to use it. I, I uh, uh, incidentally, uh, every <laughs> uh, there's a lot of money in the new translation, a lot of money uh, that uh, because as soon as people hear of a new translation, they think, oh, here's something that maybe uh, there's uh, uh, I'm going to learn something that I never knew before, and so they go out to buy uh, the new translation and. Uh, uh, and every new translation that comes along makes big uh, uh, promises about what it is. Uh, for example, I was reading uh, about some of the promises that were made by one of a very popular new translation. This has been derived from the earliest uh, Greek uh, manuscripts and so on. Just a big, fat lie. It was derived from the Latin manuscripts and not from the earliest uh, earliest manuscripts as the King James was. But, you know, we read all those, uh, those sales, those promotional statements, we take them as truth and think that we've got something wonderful. But the fact is, when we look at it very carefully, the King James Bible is still the best one. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Again, the number is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And take, shall we take our next call? Yes, hello? Yes. Hello, Brother Camping. Um, I have a question right along with that last caller. Um, I got a King James Version uh, study Bible it's by Zondervan, um, and I also have two other questions after that, uh, two Bible verses, actually. Do you suggest that uh, uh, study Bible, or what Bible do you suggest? Well, the uh, study Bible we got to be careful about because the idea is that they give the original biblical text and then put somewhere either on that same page or in another place uh, a an explanation of that passage and that can be super dangerous because now you have that bible in front of you and you read uh, the verses in question you read the explanation, and you think about it, and, and oh, I see, that's the way it is. Then later on, you don't remember what, uh, uh, when that verse is, those verses are being talked about, and you uh, have remembered the explanation you came to. You don't remember whether you got that from the text itself or from the explanation, and that's dangerous business. Actually, the Bible ought to be the Bible without any explanation. And if there is an explanation, it ought to be a separate book altogether. So you know that I read this in this separate book. It may be accurate, but nevertheless, uh, it was not... Uh, I know I didn't read it in the, in the Bible itself. Hello. I also have a two Bible verses I was hoping that you could explain for me? Yes. Uh, Matthew 13, verse 12. Matthew 13, verse 12. Let's look at that. Matthew 13, verse 12. We read... For whosoever hath, 
to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Is that the verse? Yes, sir. Um, what, who, whoever, whosoever hath what? You know, this is a tremendous principle that God is laying down. Let's take a typical church, for example. If we go back a hundred years, they had a fairly good understanding of many doctrines of the Bible. They had a correct understanding of marriage, for example, that there's not to be marriage for any, or divorce for any reason. And on many other things, they had a pretty good understanding. But now, as we're approaching this time, when, when they're being ruled over by Satan, and, and uh, uh, they are no longer having the blessing of the Holy Spirit working there, they are losing principles that originally they had that were correct. For example, and I use the marriage, a divorce situation as an illustration, uh, that you can go into that church now and find, oh yes, it's perfectly okay to divorce if uh, this happened or that happened. In other words, what they had, they had imperfectly, but what they had, they are losing. So that today, they are uh, much further away from the truth of the Bible than they were, say, 50 years or 100 years ago. And that is uh, developed before our eyes everywhere we look. So it's not actually talking about, uh, let's say, a, a true believer or someone who just wants to read no. the Bible and try to learn as much as possible. It's, it's not actually talking about like one of us, like say if I don't understand a Bible verse, it doesn't mean whosoever hath like the ears to hear. There's, it, that's like one or two verses before that verse. Well, if we are earnestly trying to understand the Bible and trying to follow the rules of the Bible, it doesn't apply to us. But if, on the other hand, we take for granted what we already know from the Bible and we don't continue to develop our our knowledge of the Bible, then slowly on what happens, what we did have is taken away from us. Okay. Can I just uh, show you one more other Bible verse as well? I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. Uh, Romans 16.6. 6. Romans 16.6. 6. Yes, sir. Let's look at that. Romans 16, verse 6. There we read... Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Is that it? Yes, sir. Um, bestowed much labor on us? I don't understand that. It, it, can you explain that? You know, it's very interesting. When you read some of the chapters of the New Testament, this is particularly true of Second uh, Corinthians, for example. And they are... They're, they read like very personal letters. And we wonder, what, does, what spiritual truth is God teaching? And in my judgment, the more I read those kind of chapters, I realize that God very carefully placed those there in order that those who do not want to believe the whole Bible is from the mouth of God can point to these verses and say, how could that come from the mouth of God? Uh, that's not possible. And so it, uh, it serves to discredit in their minds the authority of the Bible. But because we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and this verse, too, is all Scripture. And so the first thing we learn is, Look how God wrote the Bible. He makes it so that we have a hard time realizing that this came from the mouth of God, but we know that it did come from the mouth of God. Now, what? Uh, I, of course, there is some spiritual teaching here. Mary, obviously, is a woman. Can a woman be used in any sense in the kingdom work? And this is a verse that shows, yes, indeed. A woman can be used in kingdom work 
even though there are other passages that limit it so that she is not to preach, she is not to teach or have authority over men. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, I want to ask you about the parable of the marriage feast. The parable of what? The marriage feast. Of the marriage feast. Uh, you mean where there was a man that came in without a marriage garment? Yeah, but what about the other part where he said that uh, he would burn up their city? How do we understand that? He would burn up their city. Where, where Do you remember where the chapter and verse is? Yes, um... Uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Let's look at that. Matthew 20. In which verse? Uh, is it 7? I think it's 7. Number. Matthew 22, verse 7. We read, But when the king heard thereof, he was angry or wroth, uh, uh, let's let's back up and get the setting. Uh, verse 4. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, not one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and entreated and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And when the king heard these things, he was angry, and he went for, sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Is that what it is? Well, now you see here God is encapsulating the encapsulating the fact of his judgment that comes on sin. And the final product of, or the final end of sin, is the complete burning up of the city of man, namely this world. It will be completely destroyed by fire. So that's not the same city in uh, Revelation 18? Not the same as Revelation uh, 18. Let's see, which verse are you looking at there? Uh, where it talks about the smoke of the city. Uh, yes, it is. It is, but it requires a little defining. Ultimately, it is the fact that the whole world is going to be destroyed by fire. But now we have come to the end of our time. We won't be able to take any more callers. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.